motion from, uh, the, uh, that the Democrats would do in terms of fixing an egregious tax loophole for oil companies that only serves to improve their bottom line, does nothing to increase oil supply, does nothing to lower prices. Uh, but I will try and move both of those forward. Gentlemen, I yield the gentleman an additional one minute. Gentlemen, Thank recognize you. for additional one minute. I very much appreciate it. I get a little wound up on this, <laughs> but we've been working on it for a long time. But I want to conclude by saying that I hope we don't allow some strategic differences on the floor of the House between the two parties in terms of priorities. As I say, we will end up approving both these approaches because the scale of our deficit is such that we need to do it. Uh, the administration will support it. Both parties will ultimately get there. And I think the American public will support it. But we need to come together to make sure that this legislation that we're working on this week does not fall victim to cross signals on the other side of the Capitol. We need to work with the other body. We need to send a strong signal here to make sure that this mistake from 2005 is corrected now and spares unnecessary hardship for our business community, but also for state and local government and indeed for the federal government itself. Inspired. Gentleman from South Carolina. Mr. Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Randy Holcomb. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for one minute. I want to thank uh, my colleague from South Carolina. Mr. Chairman, I rise today in support of both the bills under this rule, in particular H.R. 674, repealing the 3% withholding tax on government contracts. It may have seemed like a good idea at the time, but now we clearly see that it is a mandate that drains precious resources from America's job creators, small businesses. The profit margin for many businesses affected by the proposal is often less than the 3% mandate. The withholding tax will create substantial cash flow problems and drain capital from many businesses that could otherwise be used to invest and grow or hire more workers. Mr. Chairman, I join with many business owners, state and local governments, and educational institutions in supporting H.R. 674 to repeal this tax and provide a meaningful step towards instilling certainty among job creators in getting this economy moving on the right track. I yield back. Gentleman from Florida. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield to the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating, two minutes. Gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I hope the previous question is defeated so that I can offer an amendment along with uh, my colleagues, Mr. Levin and Mr. Bishop, to really uh, correct something that, frankly, is outrageous. It's not only outrageous, but it is exhibit A of what's wrong with this Congress. The underlying bill to do away with the 3% withholding, you know, I've met with my local business people, had discussions, and this is a, a, a great opportunity for bipartisan efforts to help create some jobs, help small businesses go forward. We're actually in agreement with something that's going to do all those things. And, and I'm proud to support that, and I'm proud to reach across the aisle and support that. But I've got to tell you, you just can't mess things up more than you're messing things up here. Because the offset that was taken by the majority party is a tax on people that have Social Security and Medicaid. Now, why are you doing that uh, when you're trying to get people, uh, you know, some economic uh, benefits through businesses and, and, and really an effort that we both should be applauded for working together on? Now, the amendment I'm going to offer is going to correct that. It's going to correct it in a way that makes perfect sense and is exhibit A about what can be right about this Congress. We're going to take away that oil subsidy uh, that in the next several years is going to amount to $43.6 billion in, in a windfall to our richest, most profitable companies that don't need it. And incidentally, 93% of that windfall goes to preferred stock buybacks and executive and, and CEO uh, remuneration that uh, is not necessary. So here's what's, we have something we agree on. We have something that's going to be a benefit, that's going to create jobs and help small businesses. Now we can go one of two ways in terms of paying for that. We can 
have an additional tax on the Medicaid uh, and Social Security recipients, or we can continue to re Thank the gentleman so for 30 seconds recognized. Or we can continue to reward the CEOs and big oil. That's not a tough choice. So I hope that the previous question is defeated so we can offer something that makes sense. You know what? It's time for this Congress to get it right. We have a chance to do it, and I hope we will. Inspired. The gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just encourage my friends on the left who want to raise taxes. Raise taxes if you can, but the bottom line is that raising revenue does not make you more responsible, does not make you use the, the revenues that you currently have more responsibly. So all the notion of raising taxes to use that as a fix to this situation is inconsistent with the reality and is a part of an alternate universe that we ought not be a part of. Mr. Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Donald Manzullo. Gentleman is recognized for... One minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of the rule in the underlying bill. Instead of going after tax delinquents, the law punishes everyone for the failings of a few. When I chaired the Small Business Committee uh, several years ago, um, saw a lot of harms and injuries taking place to small business people. This is a tough one, and H.R. 674 would repeal that. The 3 percent withholding rule disproportionately hurts small businesses. I met with uh, several electrical contractors in my office recently, and the first thing on their mind uh, in their hearts was the fact that this should be repealed because it simply does not make sense. Uh, the bill would, would repeal the onerous law to the benefit of farmers and others who sell goods and services to the government at all levels, but also it repeals an unfunded mandate imposed upon state and local governments that requires them to be the tax collectors for the IRS. So the, the bill would free up precious uh, financial resources so businesses have the flexibility to hire more workers to compete the task at hand. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Florida. You got remarks from Jimmy Walmart. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, oh, I would urge uh, my good friends from South Carolina to know that I, ha I have the last speaker I am the last speaker. If you have other speakers, I'll reserve my time. We have one more speaker. Then I, I reserve my time, Mr. Speaker. General from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Dennis Ross. Gentleman from Florida is recognized for one minute. Thank you, and thank you for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the rule and the underlying bill. Okay. Now more than ever, regulatory and tax reform are needed. The 3 percent contractor withholding requirement is yet a, another onerous regulatory tax policy that will hinder small businesses' ability to survive and hire new employees. The 10.6 percent unemployment in my home state of Florida cannot handle another government job-killing regulation. Repealing this regulation will ensure America's small businesses are not assessed another regulatory cost that will either be passed on to the consumers in costs or will force another small business to shut its doors. The 3 percent withholding requirement was originally intended to make sure contractors pay taxes. In reality, it is simply a one-size-fit-all government approach to, problem problem, to a problem filled with unintended consequences. One of the most tragic consequences could be the cost to our seniors. Ninety-five percent of Medicare physicians will be affected by this withholding tax. Our seniors should not suffer because our tax code is too confusing, too burdensome, and too big. Mr. Speaker, this regulation shows why we need a tax code that is flatter and smaller and why we need Medicare reform with fewer scare tactics and more choices. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Florida. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, President Obama, as has been cited, along with uh, many of our colleagues, support changing the definition of modified adjusted um, uh, gross income. Uh, but like on other occasions, um, I have disagreed with this president on matters, and in this instance I do. Uh, there are many in the institution who have a different view. Um, uh, but there is no reason why a bill reducing access to health care for millions of Americans has to be tied to a bill that will put money back into the pockets of middle class and working uh, uh, poor Americans. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle have um, um, made uh, a conscious decision to make it harder for Americans to pay their medical bills. Now, they could have just as easily tied this bill to one that uh, reduces oil and gas subsidies. But listen, I, I just spoke to 
a group of students, um, about uh, 15 or 20 of them from American University. And I put the question to them regarding this rule, explaining to them some of the dynamics of the institution. I put the question to them, um, uh, what would seem more sensible to you? Um, uh, uh, would it be that 500,000 people um, uh, uh, should and may um, uh, lose their coverage under a measure, or that the oil companies and gas companies, and I added GE, um, uh, uh, that those kinds of companies cause these kinds of matters not to have to come into play at this time in our institution. Now, Democrats, Sandy Levin, uh, my good friend from Michigan, uh, the ranking member, uh, introduced a substitute that would eliminate oil and gas subsidies in order to repeal the withholding requirement uh, while still allowing Americans to keep their health care coverage. Yet, they wouldn't ra waive the rules uh, for that, as they've done a number of times, my Republican friends, for their own amendments, proving once again that the rules are only sacred when oil and gas and big business profits are at stake. Mr. Speaker, if we defeat the previous question, um, an amendment will be offered uh, to the rule uh, to let Mr. Levin, Mr. Bishop of um, uh, uh, New York, Mr. Keating of Massachusetts, offer the amendment we tried to have made in order in the Rules Committee yesterday. As we've said, the amendment will roll back special tax loopholes for immensely profitable big oil companies. Is there anybody that doubts that? And I mean, you know, I'd like to hear from these oil company representatives. Uh, they're, they're, they're entitled. They are a, uh, they're not a person, as some have said. They're a corporation, and they don't have, I guess, a conscience because their bottom line is to make a profit. Well, they've made a lot of it. And all we're asking them to do in this case and others, and I'll be back down here another time asking them to share some of it uh, uh, with the American people and not cause the pressing down to our states, the pressing down to our counties and municipalities and causing people who are disabled, and indeed some will lose their insurance uh, because of this. And maybe some of these people have never had a disabled person. But I had a mama that was disabled for the last two years of her life, 30 years previous to that, uh, being almost bedridden. And I know what disability is, as I'm sure some of my friends do here. Had I not been alive, she would have died many years earlier because she had no ability uh, to provide for herself. Yet Shell Oil and Exxon and GE and all these people do, and they're right about their profit making, but they're wrong about not being able to share it with the people. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to insert the text of the amendment in the record along with extraneous material immediately prior to the vote on the previous question. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote no and defeat the previous question. I urge a no vote on the rule, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back the balance of his time to Jennifer from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We find ourselves at a place where we should have been at for many, many months, and that is working in a bipartisan way to save American jobs. Mr. Speaker, it is amazing that we have this opportunity to have the president's support with, all the, with those of us on the right, to have members of the Democrat leadership joining us, 269 co-sponsors on this legislation that simply says to the job creators, we believe in you. Mr. Speaker, today we have a very simple vote. We can remove an impediment to job creation from the backs of small businesses with no overall increase in government spending. That should be our vote today. Mr. Speaker, I encourage all of my colleagues to support the rule and the underlying bill. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time and I move the previous question on the resolution. The question is, on ordering the previous question on the resolution, those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. The ayes appear to have it. Mr. Speaker, I ask for the yeas and nays. 
The yeas and nays are requested. Those in favor of a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question are postponed. When he does that, he'll read his little speech. <coughs> step down and read something back to him. Is that what we do? Um, yeah, he'll, he's going to basically read this card that appoints you as the chairman. And then once you step back up. Um, so I'll step down before he reads that? Or right. Yeah, he'll step down first. <coughs> he's going to do that. For what purpose did the gentleman from Washington? You're on the committee of whore, aren't you? Gentlemen from Washington. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on H.R. 1904. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 444 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of the Bill H.R. 1904. The Chair appoints the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 1904, which the Clerk will report by title. Facilitate the efficient extraction of mineral resources in southeast Arizona by authorizing and directing an exchange of federal and non-federal land and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, and the gentleman from, from Arizona, Mr. Gurihalva, each will control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentlemen, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, our nation has suffered through 32 consecutive months of over 8% unemployment, and people everywhere across our great nation continue to ask, where are the jobs? Congress's top priority right now is job creation, and today we have an opportunity to act on that commitment by passing a bill that would put thousands of Americans to work. The Southeast Arizona Land Exchange and Conservation Act, sponsored by our colleague from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, is a common sense measure that will create new American jobs and strengthen our economy through increased U.S. mineral production. The bill authorizes an equal value land exchange between Resolution Copper, the federal government, 
the state of Arizona, and the town of Superior, Arizona, that will open up the third largest undeveloped copper resource in the world. The bill requires the cost of the land exchange be fully paid for by the mine developer, ensuring fair treatment for taxpayers and for the government. This project will provide substantial benefits to the United States in the form of job creation, economic growth, and increased national security. This mining project will support nearly 3,700 jobs. These are good paying American wage jobs that will equate to more than $220 million in annual wages. At a time when our economy continues to struggle, this mining project will provide a much needed boost through private investment. This mining activity, activity will have over $60 billion in economic impact and will generate $20 billion in total federal, state, county, and local tax revenue. So this bill, Mr. Chairman, is a perfect example of how safely and responsibly harnessing our resources will generate revenue and get our economy back on track. The importance of U.S. copper production cannot be overstated. Our nation has become increasingly reliant on foreign countries for our mineral resources, placing our economic competitiveness and national security at risk. The U.S. currently imports 30 percent of the copper we need and we will continue to depend on foreign countries if we fail to develop our own resources and the vast resources indeed we have in this country. The copper produced from this single project, from this single project, will meet 25 percent of the United States entire copper demand. The copper could be used for a variety of projects ranging from hybrid cars like the Prius to medical devices, plumbing and computers. Without it, the microphones and lights that we're using here right now would not be functioning. It's also essential for national defense equipment and technology. It is used in satellites, space and aviation, weapons guidance and communications. The benefits and the reasons to pass this bill, Mr. Chairman, are plentiful. However, we are likely to hear several inaccurate claims from those across the aisle who are opposed to mining in America. I would like to take a moment to set the record straight right from the beginning. First, the bill follows the standard federal land appraisal process, procedures issued by the Department of Justice which has been used in this country for decades. The appraisal requires full market value to be paid for by both the land and minerals within. If by chance, there is copper production beyond, beyond, Mr. Chairman, the appraised value, the mine developer will require to pay the United States the difference, which would be assessed on an annual basis. This is an added guarantee to ensure that taxpayers get a fair return on their copper resources. Second, this bill is about creating nearly 3,700 American jobs. It's not about helping foreign mining interests, as some have charged, opposing this mine and not producing copper in the U.S. is what truly benefits foreign nations by sending American jobs overseas and making it increasingly reliant on foreign resources of critical minerals. Third, the bill requires full compliance with environmental laws and tribal consultation prior to constructing the mine. This bill provides more conservation and, pro and protection of culturally sensitive riparian and critical habitat than otherwise would occur especially areas to be conveyed currently under private ownership. Fourth, the developer has already secured over half the water needed for this project and has committed to having 100 percent of the water it needs in hand before construction begins. Claims that the project will require the same amount of use by the city of Tempe is, Mr. Chairman, a gross exaggeration. Finally, this bill does not trade away sacred sites. As previously stated, the bill requires tribal concentration. And there is a map that will be shown later on today that talks about the Copper Triangle in this part of Arizona. And you will see that on this map, which will be shown later, this mine is right in the middle of that Copper Triangle. H.R. 1904 is about creating new American jobs, strengthening our economy, and decreasing our dependence on foreign minerals. The bill has broad support both locally and nationally, including Arizona Governor Jan Brewer, 
the Arizona Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manu Manufacturing, and the National Mining Association. They all, Mr. Chairman, recognize the job-creating benefits of this bill. So I urge my colleagues to strongly support H.R. Uh, 1904 to put Americans back to work on American jobs and utilizing the vast resources in this country that should, we should be using for economic and for national security reasons. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I reserve my time. Gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. H.R. 1904 is a triple threat. It will rob Native people of their heritage, it will rob local people of their water, and it will rob the American people of their money. This legislation is simply an abdication of our responsibilities as steward of public lands and the public trust, and it must be rejected. The Congress routinely considers land exchanges. It is our responsibility to weigh the merits of each proposal to determine whether it is in the best interest of the American people. Some proposals facilitate public recreation, some help local community build courthouses and schools, and some serve important environmental goals. The land exchange required by H H.R. 1904 serves none of those purposes. Rather, this legislation will take thousands of acres of healthy, protected, sacred public land and convert it into billions of dollars in corporate profits for two foreign, two foreign mining companies. H.R. 1904 trades away several sites that are sacred to Native people. The hearing record before the Natural Resources Committee includes desperate pleas from San Carlos Apache, White Mountain Apache, Yavapai Apache, Tonto Apache, Fort McDowell, Yavapai, Wallapai, Hirakia Apache, Mascalero Apache, and the Zuni Pueblo, and others, pleading to respect the religious and cultural traditions. Instead, the bill waives compliance with NEPA, the Native the Native American Graves Protection Act and the Historic Preservation Act and all other statutes that might give the tribes a voice and respect at the table before this decision is finalized. The final insult comes when the bill requires consultation with Native people after the land exchange, after that exchange has already occurred. This will not be government-to-government -government consultation as required by the treaty trust relationship. Rather, it continues a pattern of neglect and belittles Native people once again. The legislation also threatens to dewater a large and already drought-prone area, turning it from an arid but functioning landscape into a desert. According to testimony received by the committee, a mining operation like the one planned by Resolution Copper requires an estimated 40,000 acre feet of water per year. This is roughly the amount of water used by the entire city of Tempe in Arizona. The company does not own any water rights, has failed to indicate where the water from the mining operation will come from. Historically, mining companies have simply sunk their wells deeper than their neighbors and taken the water that they need. A federal mining permit process, along with compliance with NEPA and other laws, might mitigate or at least explore these concerns, but the legislation allows Resolution Copper to skip these steps leaving the people of southeastern Arizona in, gave, in grave danger of severe water shortages. NEPA happens after the land train is finalized, when Rio Tinto, the parent company of Resolution Copper, holds all the cards. Compliance with NEPA becomes unclear and poses legal issues regarding private property. Finally, the legislation will allow Rio Tinto, the parent company of Resolution Copper, to realize billions in profits without guaranteeing a fair return to the current owners of the land, the American people. The bill contains appraisal and payment provisions, but the language is non-standard and in some cases totally unique. Why are such provisions necessary when a simple, straightforward royalty would provide a fair and predictable return to the taxpayers? At a time when we are told that everybody from college students to the elderly must accept drastic cuts to basic federal programs, it is unconscionable that we would approve a massive transfer of wealth from the American people to a foreign-owned mining company without insisting on a fair return. Supporters of this legislation claim it would create jobs. 
Job creation has been the excuse used here on the House floor to push legislation dismantling the last century of environmental protection, and H.R. 1904 continues that pattern. The job creation claims are based on predictions provided, provided by industry and the companies which stand to profit from this deal without a mining plan to verify or corroborate any of the information. Thus, they are all highly suspect. When the proposal was first developed in 2005, the Arizona Republic and the Tucson Citizen reported the mine would create 450 jobs. Without explanation, these predictions have skyrocketed over the years to 1,200, 3,700 today, and 6,000 jobs as well have been brought up as numbers of jobs that would be created. None of these numbers are supported by facts. The trend in mining over the last several decades is clear. Mining companies are producing more and more and using fewer and fewer workers. Rio Tinto, BHP, Billiton are pioneers in the use of automation, and the Resolution Copper Project is an opportunity to perfect these technologies. Even further, the number of jobs actually created by H.R. 1904 will pale in comparison to the economic and environmental devastation that it could cause. Mr. Chairman, this is a special interest legislation that is not in the interest of the American people. This legislation asks Congress to be business agents for foreign-owned corporations and not stewards of the public land or represent the American taxpayer. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm very pleased to yield five minutes to the gentleman from Arizona, the, the sponsor of this bill, somebody who has been absolutely tenacious in seeing that this legislation advances to where uh, it is today. So I yield five minutes to the gentleman from uh, Arizona. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I rise today in support of my legislation, H.R. 1904, the Southeast Arizona Land Exchange and Conservation Act, legislation that will create new American jobs, reduce our dependence on foreign sources of energy and minerals, protect high-profile conservation lands, and generate revenue for federal and state treasuries. In this time of serious economic hardship, Congress must engage in serious debate over serious issues. What should not guide Congress is an endless game of unfounded attacks that leads to trumped-up fear-mongering to gain political advantage, particularly, in this case, the fear of robots. This le legislation is a real job creator. I would like to tell a story about Chris Astor, a current employee at the mine site and a member of the San Carlos Apache tribe. Chris grew up attending public schools on the San Carlos Apache Reservation and graduated from high school in nearby Globe. In 2010, Chris was among those first in the first group of the Resolution Experience Participants, a paid three-week program Resolution launched in the summer of 2010 to introduce potential employees to the world of mining. Each participant receives a Mining Safety and Health Administrative Certified Training and then is exposed to the various work disciplines within Resolution Copper. Following this three-work program, Many of the prog program participants are hired by the company or its contractors. Among the hired employees was Chris Astor. Chris is one of seven San Carlos Apaches who have been hired by Resolution Copper or its con contractor since the program began in the summer of 2010. Chris now works as a core handler, one of the seven member crew that retrieves dr drill core samples from the rigs that do the project. I've had the blessings of doing this in my own life for my dad. Under the guidance of geologists, the core handlers log, process, and archive core samples with geologists and mine engineers, relying, helping them to rely and understand the nature of the ore body. I would like to eventually try to different jobs, get a broader view, learn, and grow into a supervisory role, Chris says. I also want to be trained to work underground. Prior to the resolution experience, Chris worked at the Pinto Valley Copper Mine, an open pit mine a few miles northeast of Resolution's project which is owned by BHP Billiton. However, this mine is currently closed. Before joining Resolution's experience, Chris had been out of work for more than a year. Chris is now a 31-year-old father of three children, ages 13, 9, and 5. 
With his stable, good-paying job, including great medical and benefits, Chris is able to confidently support his family. I can take care of my kids better and provide what they need, and sometimes even what they want, he says. Life was not always good for Chris. He grew up as an only child, raised by his mother and grandparents. He spent most of his childhood on the reservation. He went where my mom, we went where my mom could find work, he says. I never knew my dad. Chris feels fortunate to have a job and to live on the reservation, where more than 80% of the residents live in poverty and seven out of 10 eligible workers are unemployed. It is true that modern mining technology uses high-tech equipment to accomplish certain tasks. This is done for efficiency's sake and for the sake of the uh, worker safety. Mining is a potentially hazardous task and certainly a difficult one that must be done with precision. Chris is not a robot. You can still see there is a need for people to run the mine, to drive the trucks, to feed the workers, to drill the holes, to engineer the dig, to build the structures, to process the minerals, and yes, build, maintain, and control technology. Chris is a real human being operating this technology already at the site, whose life has, been, has benefited greatly from this project. If we pass this legislation, over 3,700 more success stories like Chris's will come to fruition. I urge my colleagues to continue this debate with serious discussions about the facts about this bill, not scare ta tactics. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Arizona is Mr. recognized. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield uh, as much time as it may, may consume to the gentleman from Arizona, my colleague, Mr. Pastor. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. First of all, I want to thank uh, Mr. Grijalva for the courtesy and Mr. Chairman, unanimous consent to address the House and revise and extend my remarks. Chairman, it's recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is an issue that I have been working on for probably the last 10 years. And one of the interests that I have on this issue is I was born and grew up in this copper triangle that we're talking about today. It's a beautiful area. And at one time, copper was the industry for this copper triangle and over the past 20, 25 years obviously many of the mines shut down and the copper production stopped in Arizona. And so I have to tell you that uh, my interest in this uh, land exchange and uh, would be the possible economic rise of this area. I travel through this area because my mom still lives up in Miami, Arizona, where I was born and raised. And I travel regularly, at least once a month, through these canyons, and I can tell you that it's the most beautiful site, about 85 miles east of Phoenix, where you can still see fine, pristine environment with some of the spectacular rock formation that you'll ever see in this country. So it's very beautiful. But also it's an area that's hit some hard times. I grew up in a mining town, so I know what a mining town is. During the summers, while I was attending Arizona, Arizona State University, I'd go work in the mines. So I worked in the leaching plant, the electrolytic plant, the leaching tanks, the ball mills, the Molly plant, so I have the experience of knowing this type of life. So I know the economic boom that copper mining can bring to a community, but I also have experienced the impact, the adverse impact that copper mining can have, not only on the people that work in there, but also on the environment. So I have seen both sides. So it's with that interest that I have seen the evolution of this debate. At one time, even I sponsored a bill that would deal with the economic development of these mining towns, Superior, Globe Miami, et cetera, and Oak Flats, the area that we're talking about being exchanged, is an area that I know well. As a kid growing up, we used this area for a picnic site, and in some cases, probably was a site where we didn't go to school, that's where we had our impromptu uh, picnic. So I know this area. I have to tell you that uh, 
The issue about the jobs, as it will be discussed, and I guess the number of jobs is, is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, my, uh, mining has changed, and I know that uh, it's a different type of mining since the one I experienced, and so we can debate on the number of jobs. But I will tell you that this will be, this will bring some economic development to these areas of the Copper Triangle. That I cannot deny. But the issue for me is at what price? At what price do we uh, bring this economic development without some protection to the environment, without, without some protection to the employee rights, but more, what do we do to ensure that the American public who owns this property, and there is no debate that this ore deposit is some of the richest ore bodies, copper, gold, silver, molybdenum, and other rare metals will be mined here. It's one of the richest deposits of ore, not only in North America, but probably in this world. And that's why Resolution Copper has maintained eight, nine years, ten years of trying to get this bill done, because they know how rich this is. So at what price do we pay for this economic boom? Well, Mr. Chairman, I would tell you that one of the differences that I have with the sponsor of this bill, and I have to thank him, because Representative Gosar reached out very early, and we talked about this particular bill, and he has improved the bill I sponsored, but I feel that he has not gone far enough. So this bill would be highly improved if the amendment offered today that gives an 8% royalty fee on the extraction of the ore would be fair to the American public. And so if that amendment is adopted, obviously it will be very difficult to oppose this bill. But if the amendment is not adopted, then, Mr. Chairman, I would tell you that the American public is paying a high price for the economic development of the Copper Triangle, and the only enrichment will be for those copper companies that are of foreign extraction. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the time, and I yield back my time. Chairman to yields Mr. back. The gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to yield two and a half minutes to another gentleman from uh, Arizona who, too, has been very tenacious on this issue, Mr. Quayle. Two and a half minutes. The gentleman is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, Mr. Chairman, I rise today in strong support of H.R. 1904, um, bill authored by my good friend and fellow Arizona and Congressman Gosar, that will create thousands of jobs in Arizona. I want to commend Chairman Hastings for his work on this and bringing this to the floor today. Look, what we see right now is a jobs crisis that we have in America, and we need to be able to unleash the ingenuity of our job creators. And we also have to make sure that we're not putting up barriers for people to actually start companies, expand companies, and hire new workers. H.R. 1904 will have broad economic impacts, not only for Arizona, but for the country as a whole because it will create 3,700 jobs equaling nearly $220.5 million in annual wages. These are good, high-paying jobs right here in America. And it will also generate nearly $20 billion in federal, state, county, and local tax revenue. This is a win-win. Not only is this le legislation completely paid for, but it also ensures that mining is done in a responsible manner because H.R. 1904 requires full compliance with NEPA and also requires tribal consultation prior to mine construction. Now, Mr. Chairman, copper is a vital mineral that we have in the United States and across the world. It's going to continue to be vital because it's a critical mineral that was widely used in construction, telecommunications, electricity, and transportation. Copper is also extremely conductive, which makes it very important in power generation and utility transmission. Our our actual desire and demand for copper is just going to continue to go up. And that's why we've actually started to import close to 30% of our copper from uh, foreign countries. Now, if we actually open up this mine, 
and allow this land swap to happen, we're, this project alone could provide us with enough copper to meet 25% of current U.S. demand. By taking advantage of American sources of copper, we can prevent supply disruptions and decrease our dependence on foreign imports. But most importantly, Mr. Chairman, this bill creates thousands of American jobs in a responsible manner at no cost to the taxpayer. I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Arizona. Thank you. There is a cost to the taxpayer, Mr. Speaker. The, the fact that this very valuable extraction and mineral is being uh, extracted without any royalties, without any payment, uh, I would consider that a cost to the American taxpayer. And the issue about NEPA is not semantics. NEPA and other environmental processes should occur before the land trade, not after. After the land trade, it will be very difficult for compliance to happen as a consequence now that this land will be uh, in the hands of a foreign-owned company and will be private property. With that, let me yield to uh, uh, as much time as you may consume to the ranking member of, of the Natural Resources Committee, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Markey. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. I thank the gentleman from uh, Arizona. Um, Mr. Chairman, the, the New Deal was a jobs plan. President Obama has put forward a jobs plan. H.R. 1904 is not a jobs plan. H.R. Uh, 1904 is a massive payout to multinational mining giants wearing a jobs plan as a disguise. And that disguise uh, is slipping. Real jobs are about making wise investments in businesses and technologies that put Americans to work. This bill just gives billions of dollars in copper uh, to foreign mining companies for free. So let's do the math. Estimates vary on the value of the copper from $2 billion uh, to $7 or $8 billion. So let's just split the difference down the middle and say that the copper might be worth $5 billion. Uh, the jobs claims for this bill uh, vary wildly as well from 500 to 5,000 jobs. Now there's a good reason to believe the jobs numbers will be on the very low end, but let's be optimistic and take the highest jobs claim possible. Uh, so supporters of this bill are going to give away $5 billion in hopes of creating 5,000 jobs. Well, that's $1 million per job, Mr. Chairman. $1 million, not paid necessarily to the workers themselves, but paid to foreign mining giants. Now, is that the kind of wise investment that we need? I do not think so. Uh, I think that we need uh, some new jobs, but they should be real jobs. They should be here. Much of the work that's going to be done in this mining is going to be done by robots. Uh, so there will be full employment for R2-D2 and for the transformers, but the total number of jobs here, very speculative and very expensive per job created. That's the, that's the real question here, because I think many human beings are just going to remain unemployed uh, under this plan. And since it's a multinational that gets the benefits, there'll be plenty of accountants and lawyers in London and Melbourne, uh, all around the world that will be employed. But in America, not so many. Uh, and those that are there, very expensive especially since the, the, uh, the per capita uh, cost is very, very high. Now, why do we know that? Well, we know it because Rio Tinto and BHP Billiton stand to pocket an enormous amount of money, billions of dollars off of this uh, deal. So if you count the chauffeurs, if you count the food service workers in the executive dining rooms of these companies, well, you can see where there will be some jobs that are created if you're adding it up that way. But the truth is, uh, this is a windfall, a windfall, which is why 
I am going to make an amendment to charge a reasonable royalty for the privilege of mining this copper on public lands in the United States. And when the, when the majority votes no on that, when the Republicans say, no, we don't want a royalty payment that can actually be collected by the American people, we'll see what the real aim of this is, which is to privatize this resource for multinational corporations without giving the full benefit to the American taxpayer for the copper, which is mine. And Mr. Grahalber and Mr. Garamendi uh, will offer an amendment uh, to require local hiring and local ore uh, processing and, and make it in America, make it here, and have Americans working here doing this work, people from Arizona itself. That's the real debate that we're going to have. Uh, and in conclusion, Mr. Lujan as well will offer an amendment to protect Native American sacred sites from being destroyed by this bill. And when that is defeated as well by the majority, it will be painfully clear just how far they are willing to go to enrich these for foreign corporations. This should not be a Filene's basement sale. This should not be a fire sale giving away American valuable of copper resources to multinationals, we should be able to put a price tag on what the American people are getting from this bargain basement sale, uh, this giveaway, uh, without proper uh, compensation given to the American taxpayer. That's what this uh, bill uh, and, and, it, and the debate is going to be all about. Uh, it's whether or not, in fact, there is corporate profiteering at ta taxpayer exp expense, plain and simple, uh, which is at the heart of this bill. History will record that when the public cried out for a jobs plan to put Americans back uh, to work, uh, that uh, what was put together was a retirement plan for executives at Rio Tinto and BHP Billiton uh, that did not, in fact, get a return on investment for the American taxpayers. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I please yield two minutes to uh, another gentleman from Arizona, somebody else who has all been involved uh, in this uh, uh, issue for some time. Mr. Franks, for two minutes. This gentleman is recognized for two minutes. And I certainly thank the distinguished chairman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, first just uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Gosar on the introduction and passage of this legislation. He has done an amazing job uh, in in uh, helping this legislation get to where it is now, and I have every confidence that he will see it through to the end. Uh, Mr. Chairman, according to a United States Geological Survey report, the United States currently imports over 30 percent of the country's copper demand. And in 2010 alone, domestic copper production decreased by another 5 percent. It decreased by another 5 percent. And just as relying on foreign oil imports <coughs> threatens national security, relying on foreign copper suppliers also threatens U.S. industry. We must use domestic resources to meet that growing demand, and this legislation is a major step in the right direction, producing enough copper to meet as much as 25 percent of America's current demand. The Southeast Arizona Land Exchange and Confer Confer Conservation Act would open up the third largest undeveloped copper resource in the world, Mr. Chairman. It would create new American jobs, reduce our, independence, or do, do, reduce our dependence on foreign sources of energy, and reduce our dependence on foreign sources of minerals and generating tens of billions of dollars in revenue. Now, in the midst of a prolonged recession, Mr. Chairman, that has hit Arizona very hard, we really cannot afford not to pass this legislation because it so uniformly benefits our labor force, our state and local governments, and conservationists who would benefit from the much of the high value land exchange in opening this land to mining. And I would just encourage my colleagues to vote in favor of this bill. It's time that America begin to produce our own energy and our own minerals and to get back on track of being the greatest nation in the history of the world. And I would yield back and thank the chairman. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the claim is that this legislation is going to boost the U.S. economy tremendously. But the, the copper will likely benefit China more than the United States. Nine percent of Rio Tinto is owned by the state-controlled aluminum corporation of China. Uh, they have, Rio Tinto has a long established relationship and at our hearings refused to disclaim whether, uh, what level of exportation they were going to make to China of this copper ore. At a time when we should focus on U.S. industry, on supporting that industry, 
creating jobs here in America, we should not be trading away billions in copper to supply China's need. This bill doesn't require, doesn't even require that the ore extracted from this mine will be processed here, much less that it will be marketed or sold here. With that, let me yield three minutes to the gentleman from California, member of the Resource Committee, Mr. Gary Mendy. Sir? The gentleman from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you very much for our friends from Arizona. Uh, let me just tell you, my family's been in mining since the 1860s, uh, gold mining, which isn't working too well in California right now, and I'm not at all opposed to mining copper in Arizona, although there are issues local to be dealt with, and I'll let that uh, go to another individual. I was Deputy Secretary at the Department of Interior and had the opportunity to deal with appraisals uh, and land transfers. This bill as structured is a bad deal for American taxpayers and for Americans. It basically is an enormous giveaway of extraordinary value uh, to these two companies. As has been mentioned by our colleagues from Arizona who are in support of the bill, this is one of the biggest deposits of copper and other minerals in the United States and quite possibly among the biggest in the world. What is its value? The mechanism that's used to determine the value of the trade is called a capitalization appraisal, which, us, which has to assume that they has to assume the cost, has to as make assumptions on the extraction, the cost of extraction, and the, va and the amount of ore to be obtained. There is no way in the appraisal process that that can be done with any accuracy at all. And in the language of the bill, there are certain provisions that make it impossible for the United States government to go back and do a reappraisal. So we're left with a bad financial deal. I'm all for the copper mining. It has to be done properly and environmental views and all of that. That's not the issue for me. The issue for me is let's make sure that the American public gets the right value out of this. And there's only one way to do it. And that is as the ore is extracted, it, ha it then has a known quantity and a known value and a royalty on the ore extracted, that is the material, copper, gold, and other materials, is then known. And if you simply put a royalty on that, then the American public get its fair share of its property. This property doesn't belong to Rio Tinto or BHP Billiton. This property belongs to us, Americans. May I have another 30 seconds, Mr. Grijalva? <laughs> It belongs to us Americans, and we ought to be getting our full value. This is not an obscure or new provision. This is the standard procedure. We actually use it for oil extraction, except in deep water. It's something that really will give us the value. Secondly, and I'll make this very, very short, is that the equipment used ought to be American-made. There are going to be a lot of equipment, a lot of different material, uh, equipment, and materials used. Let's make that American-made. That's an amendment that will come later. But right now, deal with the royalty issue so that us Americans, all of us, 300 million, will get our share of the extraordinary value that this mine will produce. With that, I yield back. The uh, gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I am pleased to yield two minutes to a member of the Natural Resources Committee and a a gentleman who, whose district has a, line, a long mining history, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Beneshek, for two minutes. The gentleman from Michigan. Uh, I thank the gentleman for, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I came to the floor to speak in favor of this bill because, frankly, I find it hard to believe what I'm hearing from those arguing against it. Does any, anyone honestly believe that passing this bill will create jobs only for an army of robots? Are you kidding me? Robots? According to one study, this bill may create as many as 3,000 real jobs for humans. Mr. Speaker, my district in northern Michigan is a long way from Arizona. We too have a lo long, rich history of copper mining. Today, people need copper in their daily lives. And the growing demand need, means we need more mines, creating more jobs in Arizona and Michigan. My own father was a miner. Congress needs to demonstrate that the American people, to the American people, that it supports mining jobs and developing our nation's resources, as this bill does, in a way that's both environmentally responsible and culturally respectful. I urge the passage of this bill 
and yield back the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields back, gentleman from Arizona. Mr. Speaker, uh, could I inquire so much time each side has? The gentleman has eight minutes, and uh, the gentleman from Washington has 12 and a, 13 and a half. 13 and a half, eight. Thank you. And with, let me, uh, if I may, yield three minutes to uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, uh, Mr. Ellison. Gentleman from Minnesota. Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid that this bill is another example of the majority having no real jobs agenda. The Republicans are claiming that this bill will create jobs in Arizona, and of course our whole country wants more jobs anywhere we can get them. But the truth is that no one really knows the exact economic impact of this mine. The only job numbers that we have to go on are those provided by Rio Tinto, a foreign parent company of Resolution Copper. When this proposal was first developed in 2005, it was reported that the mine would, call, would, would create about 450 jobs. Without any explanation, no data, no analysis, or very little, that, uh, the, the estimates have skyrocketed to over 1,200 jobs or even 6,000 jobs. Now, that sounds enticing, particularly to a country where we have 10%, uh, 9% unemployment, but without any data to support it, it just seems like speculation. You could just say it's going to create a gazillion jobs. Why not? Anything to get the deal. There's no way to know because the numbers are not supported by a mining plan of operations or an impartial economic documentation of any kind. This bill is an affront to the National Environmental Policy Act. Under this legislation, by the time any environmental review or accurate job figures are available, the land will already be in private hands. In fact, there is no job requirement in the bill. There is no job requirement in the bill despite the vaunted promises of 6,011 million jobs. This bill doesn't include any local jobs requirement from the mining company. At a time when the whole country is looking to Congress to create much needed jobs and that we really are vulnerable to any promises of jobs, our colleagues across the aisle should be really focusing on creating jobs in America, not just large vaunted promises that really have no background or substantiation. Our colleagues across the aisle are spending this, the time in this House to create a special interest carve out for a giant multinational corporation. It's, by the way, uh, owned by people outside the United States. Uh, I, I